called Eat the Frog, and I'm going to explain what that is in just a minute, but that's kind of a weird title for a sermon, don't you think? Am I just the only one that thought that that was weird? Is this thing working? It's weird. Is it on? Are we going? Okay, cool. All right. So, uh, yeah, Let, let's open in prayer and then we'll get started because uh, I've got a few things to talk to you about. Uh, no long movie, uh, what do you call it, clips today, though, so that's good. Okay. Uh, Father, we thank you this morning, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you have given us uh, all 24 hours in a day, that, and we could use some of those hours to serve you and your church, Lord. Help us to do that, and help us to uh, be good stewards of what you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. That's right, eat the frog. Okay, we're going to be talking about stewardship this morning, and why eat the frog? Well, we'll be talking about habit stacking and things like that, but before we get into that, let me, let's remind you a few things. Uh, the first part was flip the script. Second was kiss the wave. And if you remember, flip the script was, you know, forget about the past, learn from it, move on. And in your future, the habits you're going to develop to win the day, the daily habits, we need to remind ourselves that we are blessed. We are chosen. We are blameless, adopted by the heavenly father. We are redeemed by Christ. Amen. So, you know, I mean, Nothing else, you get out of this, just remember you're redeemed by Christ. That's, that's, that's the big deal, right? Uh, you're sealed by the Holy Spirit and stamped with the image of God. And I'm not making this up. This comes from Ephesians 3, 1 through uh, 3, uh, 3, Ephesians 1, 3 through 13. Okay, get my, my numbers backwards there, but there you go. All right, so that was the first week. It's just a quick reminder. Last week, we talked about kissing the wave. And that was about uh, embracing the challenges that we get. And we quoted Charles Spurgeon that says, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. Anybody ever have a wave like that that threw you against, brought you closer to the Lord? Amen, right? Some people either go further from the Lord when a tragedy happens or be, or be drawn closer. I, I choose to be drawn closer. Okay, well this week is eat the frog. And I'm not going to tell you what it means just yet, uh, but I will say that almost anyone can accomplish anything if they work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. Genesis 6, 3, 13 through 22. Now, I, I don't have this all up here for you. I'm just going to read it to you. Then God said to Noah, the end of humanity has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of people, and behold, I am about to destroy them with the earth. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood, and you shall make the ark with compartments, and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, its width 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. You shall make a window for the ark, and finish it to a cubit from the top, and put a door on the ark on the of the ark on the side, and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Now behold, I myself am bringing the flood of water upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which there is breath of life from under heaven. Everything that is on the earth shall perish, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark and your sons, your wife, and your son's wives with you, and every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every kind into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds according to their kind, and the animals according to their kind, and of every crawling thing on the ground according to its kind. Two of every kind will come to you to keep them alive. As for you, take for yourself some of the very food that is edible, edible and gather it for yourself, and it shall be food for you and them. So, what does this have to do with habit stacking and, 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 and creating a habit and winning the day? Well, how long was the ark? We told you up there it was, uh, let's see, I had it right here. 300 cubits by 50 cubits by 30 cubits. That is about 450 feet long. That's one and a half football field in length, okay? Uh, it's 75 feet wide and 45 feet tall. Now, do you think he did that in one day? <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, uh, the gospel, uh, the, the Genesis 6-3 tells us, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not remain with man forever, 
because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. Now, Bible scholars, and I tend to agree with them, means that God put a countdown on humanity at that point for 120 years. He basically gave Noah 120 years to build the ark. There are people that argued against that, but I, I think this is a good argument that it, it actually was 120 years to build the ark because there were people after Noah that lived longer than 120 years. And here God is saying, you know, this, his days will only be 120 years. So he's talking about the 120 years that it takes Noah to build the ark. Noah won the day every day. Noah did what God told him to do. How do I know that? Genesis 6.22. He says right here, so Noah did these things according to everything that God had commanded him, so he did. What a beautiful sentence, right? Noah following the will of God and creating those habits that had to be done to build that ark. You know, I believe it was probably just Noah, his kids, his, you know, their wives, and uh, maybe he paid some people to help him build it. I don't know. But he certainly didn't do it in a week or a year, right? 450 feet, I mean, you know, there's not like they had power saws back then, right? And he did what God told him to do, and God gave him the way to do it. He gave him the plans for the ark, all right? He told him how to build it, and Noah did it. And as we know, you remember that uh, amateurs built the ark, and experts built the Titanic. You've heard that, right? <laughs> And what's the difference? Well, one survived, the other didn't. So Noah developed some of these habits. And uh, go back here. Here it goes. Almost anyone can accomplish anything if they work at it long enough, about 120 years, right? Hard enough, he did what God told him to do, and smart enough, he had the plans to build the ark. He did what God was telling him to do there, and uh, he had his family involved, and, and they built that ark 120 years later. Now, let's go to a more modern-day example here, okay? Uh, it's about the math induction theory and domino. Don't worry, it's not boring. Okay, it sounds boring, math induction. It's, it's not a math class, all right? But Bob Specka was a sophomore at Marple Newton High School when he was first introduced to the math induction theory. His teacher, Mr. Dabransky, likened that theory to the domino effect. Well, after school, Bob Specka went out and bought two boxes of dominoes and lined them up, 112 dominoes in a row. And he pushed one over, and you know exactly what happened, right? The domino effect. Well, after graduating high school, Bob Specka appeared on The Tonight Show, right, with Johnny Carson to show off his domino skills. The Guinness Book of Records created a category to recognize his accomplishments in 1976. He set the first world record in domino toppling with a chain reaction numbering 11,111 dominoes. Over the next decade, he would break his own record five times, finally finishing out with 97,500 dominoes. You think it, he had a little habit to get up and put those dominoes together every day and make sure nobody went in the room and knocked them over, you know, before his time? I, I, we see those, uh, this show called, uh, was it like Domino, what are the Domino Kings or Domino Masters or something, where um, people, they have to build their own domino thing like this, and, but now they're, they're just so crazy because the, the dominoes do so many different things. Well, here we go. Around the same time that he was setting domino world records, a physicist named Lauren Whitehead was doing experiments with a domino chain reaction. Whitehead discovered that a domino is capable of knocking over a no another domino that is one and a half times its size. So uh, basically, you, you could take a, a, a two inch domino and it could knock down a three inch domino. A three inch domino could knock down a four and a half inch domino, and so on and so on. By the time you get to the 18th domino, you could topple the leaning tower of Pisa. Okay, that's, that's and here's an example of the domino theory. Starting with that little domino way down here, he just hit it and boom, 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 boom. You've got the energy that is going and knocking him down. So by the time you get to the 18th domino, you can do the leading tower of Pisa, okay? Uh, the 21st domino could walk, knock down the Washington Monument. That'd be a pretty big domino, right? Here's an even bigger one. The 27th domino could knock over the 160-story Burj Khalifa. 
That's that big building in the Middle East, right? That's like the biggest thing in the world. So, uh, but this is talking about habit stacking, okay? We're gonna use habit stacking, doing little things which will create big things in our life, okay? Uh, and here we go. If you do the little things like they're big things, God will show up and do the big things like they're little things, amen? Noah, I believe, did the little things. He did the little bits at a time until finally that ark was built 120 years. And by the way, has anybody here ever done anything for 120 years? No. You think that would take great faith, great persistence? Yes. And, but Noah did it. That's what the Bible says. But Noah, Noah did as God told him to do. That is a great thing, right? So here it is. Eat the frog. Where do we get this from? Well, purportedly, Mark Twain said, I love this quote, if you, have to, if you ever have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. Why? Because you can go through the rest of the day knowing the hardest task is behind you. <laughs> Yuck, right? <laughs> I think not, not, doesn't have to be the first thing in the morning, but you need to carve out time in your day to do your daily habits to do what you want to accomplish in life. You know, you look at your big goal and you break it down into smaller pieces here. Uh, I have an example from the Brooklyn Dodgers. Okay. And no, it's not Jackie Robinson. Although a lot of people might think it was Jackie Robinson. Jackie Robinson was a great player. Amazing player. Hall of Famer. Broke the color barrier. All right. But it's George the Shotgun Shuba. Anybody ever heard of him? Okay. Not everybody has. Well, let me show you a picture of him. This is Jackie Robinson coming into home plate in uh, the third inning where he hit a three-run home run, the first uh, African-American to hit a home run, a black man to hit a home run in, in, in the minor leagues, and George Shuba is shaking his hand. This was uh, in the Associated Press. It was the handshake that went around the world. It's pretty amazing, I think, right? Uh, as you don't see the picture here, but in the bigger photo, all the other teammates are like, they didn't want to touch Jackie Robinson. George Shuba was the next man up to bat, and you can just see the joy on their faces, right? Okay, well, this isn't about that, but I thought it was a cool story, side story, all right? So let me tell you about uh, George Shuba. Well, I'll just leave this picture up here, okay? In his book, The Boys of Summer, and by the way, the, the entire title of this book is called The Boys of Summer, the classic narrative of growing up within shouting distance of Ebbets Field, covering the Jackie Robinson Dodgers and what's happened to everybody since. <laughs> That's from, uh, you know, New York, it's uh, Harper Press in, uh, in 2006. Anyway, uh, let's just call it The Boys of Summer. So, uh, he profiles George Shuba, and he describes Shuba's swing as natural as a smile. Okay, this, uh, Roger Kahn he did that. Shuba laughed at Kahn's description. He said, during the off-season, Shuba would swing a weighted baseball bat 600 times a day. Yeah. And that was after working his off-season job. Because, you know, back then, they had to have a job on the off-season. They didn't pay them enough, right? Every evening, Shuba would take 60 swings, then mark an X on a swing chart. After, another, after 10 rounds of 60 swings, Shuba would call it a night. He was thinking 10 times, you know, theory, right? He was thinking, you know, not 10% improvement, but 10 times improvement, all right? Okay, he set goals that are 10 times greater than what you think is possible. You could take actions that are 10 times greater than what you believe is necessary. George Suba was practicing the 10 times effort, all right? That was his daily ritual for 15 years. Roger Kahn called his swing as natural as a smile. He said, you call that natural? I swung a 44-ounce bat 600 times a night, 4,200 times a week, which was 47,200 swings every winter. Wow. Again, he had small habits, and he, and he built them up. And uh, at one time, I believe in the minor leagues, he was batting like 390 and but they wouldn't bring him up for political reasons i won't get into that right now but if you want to check it out you, you read the book but 
So basically, he was habit stacking, and habits are a great way to get into uh, building, building what you want to do in the future. One of the things I do every morning, and I'm so glad I found my cross again, was uh, I try to put this cross on every morning. And this cross is not to go out there and say, hey world, look at me, I'm a Christian, you know, I'm better than you. And uh, No, this is to remind me who I am in Christ Jesus. And so it's one of the habits I have, I, I put this cross on, and I lost it for like six months or longer, but I finally found it, and now I'm back to wearing it again. And I don't always wear it outside my shirt, sometimes I wear it inside. It's just a reminder, it's a habit that I have developed that helps me remember who I am in Christ and it draws me closer to Christ as a result of that. Now, when we're managing our habits, okay, we can identify our strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And you can reinvent yourself, you can reprogram your mind, you could repurpose your heart, you can reinvent your body. Now, some of you are thinking, okay, this is just repackaged self-help. No, no, no. This is a stewardship issue. God gives us all 24 hours a day, amen? Okay, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, wealthy, a billionaire, or you, you, you know, you, you, don't, you have nothing. You still have 24 hours, and you can use some of that time to cultivate good habits, i.e. God habits. Maybe things that will bring you closer to God as a result of that, all right? Uh, things that will improve your life. And you're, not, you're never too old to start this. I know in the... Uh, give of your best of the master, it says give of the best of your youth, but I would rewrite that and say, give of the best of your youth and your middle and old age. <laughs> right? And some of us under, you know, identify with the middle and old age. I'm not going to call out anybody, but uh, I'm one of them. But anyway, uh, so habits, how do we eat the frog? Well, you pick a habit, any habit, right? And you've got to have three M's to it. Your habits must be measurable. They must be meaningful, and they must be maintainable. All right? So let's look at some measurable habits here. Uh, again, pick a habit, and you, you measure where you're at and where you want to be. And I'll give you an example from my life. Uh, before I was uh, 18 years old, uh, and I was going to join the Army after I got out of high school, I knew that it was going to be physically challenged. And so for that last year of my senior year, I would work out two hours a day. In the morning, I would get up. And I don't think my family's ever heard this, but it's true. Okay, <laughs> I would get up and I would run, which I hated doing, okay? It would take me a long time to run. I'd just run around the block a couple times and, and then I lifted weights. And I actually went into the army, I think it was like at 165 pounds. I'm not there anymore, okay? I'm old and I'm eat, okay? But back then, but back then, right, I, I was 165 pounds, and I thought, oh, good. I'm going to put on some more bulk when I get out of, you know, basic training, and, and I'm going to be big, even bigger than I was. I actually went in at 165 and came out at 155, but I was in better shape than I'd ever been because uh, in the Army, the things that are measurable, you've got to do the two-mile run within, uh, I believe when I was in, it was 18 minutes. Now, you could do it soon, faster than that, but 18 minutes was barely passing. I believe I did it in 14 minutes. I hated running, okay? I did it in 14 minutes, but I did it. I also had to be able to do a, a 5K run with full rucksack on. Rucksack is all your equipment and stuff in boots. A 5K run, yeah. I don't think they do that anymore. I, I don't know, but I, I think too many soldiers messed up their feet and had to leave basic training as a result of that because they're running in their boots. But you know what? In combat, you don't wear tennis shoes. So, you know, you train as if you're going to war, and that's what we did. So I would get up every morning, like I said, before I went into basic training, I knew it was going to be physically challenging, and so I was in the best shape of my life. Of course, I was 18 at the time, so it helped, right? <laughs> but you know what? I, I, if I wanted to do it again, I, I could get back into shape again. A few years ago, my daughter bought me a really nice shirt when she visited Israel. It was the Beatles shirt. I like the Beatles. And it was in Hebrew. Uh, was it the Let It Be shirt? Yeah, the Let It Be shirt, right? And she brought it, and, and she gave it to me, and I tried it on, and it like went to here on me because I was fat, -er, okay? And it didn't fit. I was so embarrassed, man. I, I started, you know, doing some kind of pro program, and, but I was taking pictures of my weight every day and keeping track of it, and I went from 230 pounds to 180 pounds. Uh, 
and then COVID hit and I put it back on again, but we'll, we won't go to that. But I was able to wear that shirt for a while because I had a goal. It was measurable, right? So that brings me to the next one. It's got to be meaningful. Okay, you can do the habit for, do a habit. You want to develop your relationship with God. You want to be better in business. You're better, better in, in, in your skills for maybe uh, relating to people. You, you can build this habit, but it's got to be meaningful. Why would you want to do this? It's the big why. Your why is more important than the how. All right? Uh, so, example, when I was, you know, training to go into the army, it's because I didn't want to get my behind kicked by the other soldiers that were going to be there. I wanted to be able to keep up with them. Because I learned and I knew from watching movies and talking to people that were in the army that if you didn't carry your own weight when you were in basic training, well, they didn't carry it for you. They beat you up until you started carrying your own weight, right? And, uh, you know, and it didn't work. It wasn't that way in officer school when I finally became an officer. But, but enlisted, it was a little different. You had to carry your own weight. And you had to help your brother if he got injured or, or wounded in, in battle. And it's an, in, it's an injury in training, but it's wounded in battle. Uh, but so you had to carry your own weight. So the, the, the why was, you know, I didn't want to wash out a basic training like so many people did. I wanted to get through it and be a soldier. So that was my why, okay? And then finally, it's gotta be maintainable, okay? You can't wake up the next morning and say, I'm gonna do 100 sit-ups if you've never done a sit-up in your life, all right? Maybe do one or two, next do three or four, but keep track of it and maintain that. There's a really interesting part in the Gospel of Matthew when Jesus is talking about an unclean spirit that comes out of a person. I don't know if you've read this or you just kind of gloss over it when you, when you go through the Gospels. Well, look what Jesus says here. Now, when the unclean spirit comes out of a person, it passes through waterless places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when it comes, it finds it unoccupied, swept, and put in order. Then it goes and brings along seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they come in and live there. And the last condition of that person becomes worse than the first. That is the way it will also be with this evil generation. Now, I know he's not talking about individual. He's talking about the generation, uh, you know, that we're, gonna re, we're rejecting him. This is a hard, verse to, a hard passage to exegete. But I think it makes sense. If you get rid of a bad habit and don't replace it with a good one, it's going to get worse for you. You're not going to, you know, it's like, let, let, me, let me just say this. Uh, you don't stop sinning by not sinning, okay? That's like someone saying, don't think about the Jolly Green Giant. Did you all just think about the Jolly Green Giant? <laughs> right? It, it, it can't be done, okay? You can't say, be spontaneous, because now you're not going to be spontaneous, right? It, it creates a no-win situation. The same goes for every temptation we face. We face. I wish eating the frog was as easy as just say no. It's not. The solution, you need a, bi you need a vision bigger and better than the temptation. All right? Uh, the best way to break a bad habit is by building a good habit. And that's what we're talking about, the habit stacking and the, the domino theory, right? Uh, it's easier said than done, I know, and it takes time and effort, but you've got to reinvest your time, talent, and treasure into a good habit, a God habit. William Glasser wrote a groundbreaking book called Positive Energy in the 70s. He said, oh, I'm sorry, Positive Addiction. Addiction is not all bad, said Glasser. Sure, negative addictions destroy our lives, one drink, one click, one hit at a time, right? But positive addictions have the opposite effect. In a, in a sense, all of us are addicts. The question is, are those addictions positive or negative? Right? The question is, positive or negative, healthy or unhealthy, holy or unholy. All of us could afford to complain a little less. Am I right? <laughs> but you don't just stop complaining. You've got to switch the habit. Remember a couple weeks ago, or well, it was even last week, I mentioned create a gratitude journal. I have a business coach uh, in my magic and balloon business, and uh, he, one of the things that he requires of us when we call in and we get counseling from him and he helps with the marketing and all that, the first thing he says is on the, the coaching form that we fill in, three things you are grateful for this week. 
So you've got to keep your eyes out for it. It could be something as simple as salvation, which isn't simple theo theologically, but, you know, it's simple for us, right? Uh, that's, we remember that we are blameless and we are chosen by God. Go back to Ephesians 1.3. Look around for the positive in you. I'm not saying look at the world in rose-colored glasses and be a Pollyanna, but find more positive things than negative things. You want a good way to start that? Turn off the news. Okay, most news is completely negative. Every now and then you get a good story, but where is that buried? Like at the very last story, right? And you've got to go through all the murders and the trials and everything before you get to that good story, right? So instead of having these bad habits and, and getting rid of the habits completely, do a habit switch. Develop a good habit, all right? And then finally, we want to do uh, habit stacking. And that goes back to the domino theory, right? Uh, having daily rhythms and daily rituals. Again, one simple way to do this is turn certain times of the day into alarms. Okay, now you've done this in life already. Think about it. Anybody ever been to school? When the bell rings at the beginning, what do you do? You go to your classroom, sit down on the desk, right? Someone walks into the room that's uh, not a child, what do you do? You're quiet or you stand up and you greet the person, depends on the teacher, what you do, but the habits are there. Uh, daily prayer. We have a habit here every week, I think it's a great habit. We recite the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you just like run through it and don't think about it, okay, you've, you've done it, but you can actually think about the words and what they mean. Again, you look at the Lord's Prayer and we're talking about God, you know, deliver us, you know, uh, from evil, that's the future, right? Forgive us our trespasses, that's the past, and give us our day, give us this day our daily bread, that's the present. So the Lord's Prayer is a great way, a great uh, example of habit creating, okay? Uh, another example of habit stacking, this might be new, but the idea is as old as a Shema, and uh, it says, Deuteronomy, hear Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Now, how did God make the Israelites have the words on their heart? You can't just say, hey, these words are on your heart, now they're on your heart, right? No, he gave them a habit. What did he say? Well, God didn't just leave them here with a way to fail. Look at verse 7. It says, And you shall repeat them diligently to your sons and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. That sounds like a daily habit, right? You shall also tie them as a sign to your hand, and they shall be as frontlets on your forehead. You're walking around with a box with God's words on your forehead? You're going to remember that. Now, we don't need to do that today. I mean, I mean, guess you could, right? Uh, but, and you shall also write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, your life should be a habit towards God. And God gave Israel a way to do that. And we can do that too, right? Get up. Ten minutes earlier, and read your Bible. Pray. You know, we can't read the Bible in one day. Don't even try. Don't think, hey, I'm going to read 20 pages today, and, and 30 pages tomorrow, and 40 pages. No. You know, but you can spend 10 minutes a day reading the Bible. 10 minutes a day in thoughtful prayer, in meditation on God's Word. It's not a big habit. It's a little thing that will produce long-term eternal results, I believe. Okay? Can you do it for a day? I think so. Now, don't try to change 17 things at a time, okay? You'll fail on the first day. Focus on one habit, maybe two, if you have it stacked. Maybe listen to an audio book while you ride a bike or run. Of course, I would never run, but, you know, if you wanted to, you could, okay? <laughs> uh, but you can, you can habit stack them and put them on top of each other. And for better or worse, let's remember that we are the sum total of our habits. Bad habits always come back to bite us. Good habits always come back to bless us, right? And not just bless us, but the people around us. Some of the things that I think are just amazing, if you go back east and you visit like Monticello, you can see all the things that even Thomas Jefferson did when he was alive. 
and he kept a journal every day of things that he did. So not only did he do them, but he wrote them down so that we could see. And we think, oh, we don't have any time today, you know. Well, you know what? We have modern appliances that do things for us that never did for us, uh, you know, computers, right? And, but Thomas Jefferson accomplished so much in, in the same amount of time that we had, 24 hours a day. We need to start thinking of where we want to change our life to. Again, you don't have to be young to do it. If you're already in middle age or older age, you can start developing those habits now and be drawn closer to the Lord, okay? It starts with the first domino. You've got to fill out the application. You've got to make the first appointment. You've got to check the first box. You've got to do the first workout. And you've got to lose the first pound. <laughs> if you flick over the first domino, it's called the math induction theory, right? It takes a little effort to flick over a domino. But the flick of the finger, by the time you reach the 13th domino, the potential energy is 2 billion times greater than the energy it took to knock over the first domino. So that habit stacking really does work in real life too, okay? So a six-pack maybe, and when I say a six-pack, I'm not talking about beer, a six-pack of, you know, maybe uh, 100 pounds from here, right? Writing a book may be 50,000 words away. If anybody ever had the, the goal to write a book, I personally never had that goal, right? Uh, Debt-free may be $100,000 beyond your budget. Reconciling a relationship may require 17 counseling sessions. I don't know. But if you focus on the outcome, the finish line seems so far away that you're tempted to quit before you even start. The same is true of almost any challenge, isn't it? Slice the pie into pieces. How? Identify the lead measures that will produce the desired outcome you want. Then do it for a day. Win the day. It all comes down to one question. Can you do it for a day? When it comes to habit formation, it's the question. Pick a habit, any habit that you want. Make it measurable, meaningful, and maintainable. Then with a flick of the finger, knock over that first domino. Do a little habit switching, habit stacking. The cumulative effect of those daily habits will pay dividends until the day you die. Amen? They also leave an inheritance for all eternity. Eat the frog. <laughs> Let's pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness, your graciousness, and your gospel, Lord. Thank you that you've given us the 24 hours to use some of that to be drawn closer to you and to do your work. Lord, uh, help us to develop habits that want people to ask the question, what do we have in our life that they don't have? And then be able to share the gospel with them. Help us, Lord, to develop the habits that will help our families and our relationships and be drawn closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, and let's end with, uh, what are we going to end with? What a beautiful name. Yes, God has a beautiful name. And we want to remember that as we develop these daily habits. And next week, I think we're flying the kite. I'll get to that later. All right, here we go.